Greetings, this is Greg Thomas, and welcome to the Welsh American Channel. In early October of 2023, my wife PJ and I had a grand tour and a, the grand honor of spending a few days in North Wales. And one of our tour guides was Trevor Taylor, the proprietor of Tudno Tours. You are traveling to North Wales in the future. I encourage you to contact Trevor for an exceptional touring experience. In the comments section below, I'll leave his complete contact information. He comes highly recommended. Trevor is very knowledgeable about North Wales and was the head of geography at Flodudno Secondary School for 27 years. Trevor, welcome back to the channel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Good to see you again. It's good to see you. Thanks again for joining us. Last time we discussed the top six places to visit in beautiful North Wales. And today we are going to discuss the differences between North and South Wales. Cymru is a varied and very beautiful country. Today we'll discuss some of its unique diversities. So you ready, Trevor? Yeah, I'm ready. You fire your questions at me and I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. All right. Sounds great. Well, North and South Wales both have their own unique charm and appeal, and each region has its own distinct landscape and attraction. I visited the South Wales in the 80s. I visited North Wales, in which you were uh, one of our tour guides in October of last year. And I believe that most people would say there's a cultural difference between the North and the South. I mean, heaven knows in the United States, there's an incredible difference between the North and the South, the South where the mountain ranges are. And it tends to have an effect on people's culture and uh, view of the world. So that's kind of what we would like to discuss today. As I said, most people would agree that there's a cultural difference between the North and the South. And being a former geography teacher, mm -hmm. uh, is there a geographic pattern or some difference that may have led to North Wales being a little different than South Wales? Absolutely. I mean, we, we're, we're a nation that's, that's made by our mountains uh, uh, and it's the, the location of the mountains that has the bigger, big effect uh, on, on our culture. Um, you can divide it into north and south. Uh, when, when you said you wanted to do out the regions, mm -hmm. I, I, I drew a very rough sketch map, and I, I, I could I could only get it down to about ten different areas. And I, I got, to, got to have that one. I've got to have that one. Wow, so there is, a, there is yeah. a north south divide, but even within the north and within the south, there, there are different areas, and sure. it is down to the geography. Um, you've got the Cambrian Mountains, which run all the way through the middle part of Wales, and very very few people live in the middle part of Wales. It's it's, it's the most sparsely populated area of Wales. So as you're driving from the north, it, it, when you're along the North Wales coast, uh, mm -hmm. that's definitely North Wales. When, when you're on the South Wales coast, that's def, def, definitely South Wales. Right. There's sort of a hazy area in between where, where, it, where it divides, but so few people live there, it's quite hard to figure out where, where the dividing line is. Um, but if you're going to put a dividing line, I'd say it's where, where the Cambrian Mountains actually finish. Um, so they go down to about a place called Bilth Wells, uh, and that's where, where, where it starts, starts getting into lower land. And that's where the people would identify themselves more as South Whaling. And then above mm -hmm. there, they'd, they'd identify themselves as North Whaling. Of course, it's not just a, a feeling that it's a difference between the two of them. There's even right. differences in the language between North and South. Um, so um, we, we're, it comes back to the history of Wales. I mean, Wales, Wales hasn't mm -hmm. been its own country really ever uh, in terms of exactly a, a country that's been totally governed. A few um, princes, mm -hmm. Llewellyn Bowd, uh, nearly made uh, the whole area uh, theirs, but even 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 those princes weren't in charge of all of the place that we now call uh, Wales. Um, so, so therefore, because there's been lots of different kingdoms mm -hmm. over time, um, they would each put their stamp on a particular area. So it depends who you were run by 800 years ago. It's amazing to think that something happened 800 years ago would affect the people today, but it, but it does. It, 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 so we've got the geographical barriers of mountains Plus, then you've got the, the historical uh, layer put on top of that in terms of different kingdoms at different times. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. if I re remember my history correctly and, and certainly correct me if I'm wrong, the, those mountains provided a protection and a barrier for Wales, whether it was Anglo-Saxons or Normans. England yeah. was rather flat. So if you had a large army, superior weaponry or whatever, it was fairly easy to march across the English landscape village to village, place to place, and continue to move west. But I believe those mountains were what actually protected the Britons who had fled west and uh, gave them some sanctuary. Is that correct? 
your, your, your history is spot on. Well done. Absolutely. <laughs> You can you can actually as you're driving towards Wales and you get to mm-hmm. the border, you can see. Hang on, I'm just <laughs> the road starts going uphill. Uh, it, it usually is the border is usually where there is a, a range of hills or mountains as, as it came, because of course the Welsh tribes were very good at guerrilla warfare, is what we call mm-hmm. it now. Um, so mm-hmm. as, as as you said, the, the the Saxons and particularly the Normans when they came through with their big heavy armour, um, they, they were a very right. slow moving force, and whilst obviously they had the had the power to take over areas. Um, as they came into the mountains, uh, they, they could get, get themselves down the valleys, uh, but then they were finding at night, of course, they were being attacked uh, by raiders coming down off the hills and then running back up into the hills. Uh, mm-hmm. And if, if, you, if you tried running up a hill with a suit of armour, it's not easy. Um, so sure. yeah, they tended yeah. to, and, and that's why they, they'd say, well, it's, it's, Wales isn't really worth the bother. Um, mm-hmm. So the, the Kingdom of England, um, um, obviously we, we went to uh, Carnarvon Castle, that was built by Edward I, it, that was the real attempt by the kings of England to become the mm-hmm. kings of Wales. Before that, there had been a few sporadic attempts in, in a few places, particularly along the South Wales coast, because uh, right. South Wales is, is lower and flatter, so that, that is, that's easier. So the Romans did get along there. Uh, the Normans did get, get, get along there in certain places. And again, that history, mm-hmm. um, although it's a long time ago, has an impact on the culture of those areas and making them different as, as they are today. Yeah. When many people think of Wales, they naturally think of mountains. And I read that if Wales were flattened out, it is so mountainous that if it were flattened out, it would be a larger landmass than England. So there we are. <laughs> I thought that was <laughs> well, quite up. interesting. So can you tell us a bit about the major mountain ranges? You've mentioned one, some other mountain ranges and the effect that they have, may have had on the nation. Yeah, well, the, 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 the main, what, what happened with Wales is, is we've mm-hmm. got... Um, plates have been, have been moving and the middle part of Wales is almost like an accordion and that's squashed upwards. And, and it, so we call it the Cambrian mm. Mountains, but that's, okay. that's a whole series of different mountain ranges with different geological times. So in the north, you've got Snowdonia. In the northeast, you've got the Moylewin Range. Uh, and then in the south, you've got the Brecon Beacons uh, acting mm-hmm. as, as the main uh, mountainous areas. Um, but geologically, they're, they're all from a very similar time, which is mm-hmm. uh, the Cambrian period, so 500 okay. million years ago. Uh, that's mm-hmm. when most of Wales was made, and because it's such hard rock, um, what it was what was thought is at the time it was a super volcano, just like Yellowstone National Park is today. Okay. And uh, what's happened is uh, it was a super volcano that never went off. If super volcanoes ever do go off, I don't want to worry you living uh, in, in the <laughs> states. Uh, if ever they do go off, we're talking mass extinction events. Um, I think you're safe. I think I, I, I don't. It, it is overdue, uh, Yellowstone, but I don't think it ever will go off. Uh, and then what will happen eventually with, with Yellowstone, as happened with Wales, um, is the, the forces of volcanicity, the hot spot that's underneath it, making the molten lava underneath the surface, uh, will, will disappear. Uh, and it's slowly, very, very slowly cooled down. And because it was cooled down very slowly, and because mm-hmm. it wasn't exposed to the air, the rocks are pretty solid and massive, which is why they've lasted over 500 million years and, and, and still stand up today. So, um, so I say the Cambrian Mountain is the main mm-hmm. spine as you go down through, but then there's different parts of those Cambrian Mountains with slightly different geology. So th- that's interesting. Is there also a climate difference between the north and the south because of those mountain ranges? In a, there is, it's, it's more between actually east and west. So if you, if you to the west of the mountains, it's very wet. You've got the onshore wind. The winds usually, in this part of the world usually come from the west or the southwest. So uh, in the, lead, in, in the French slopes of the mountains, you've got uh, plenty of rainfall. Obviously, an awful lot of rainfall on the mountains. But then on the far side mm-hmm. of the mountains, uh, in, in the Welsh borderlands, in northeast Wales, um, what you've got there is, is a much drier climate. Um, so here in Tlandidno, we, we, we're in a, actually officially in a rain shadow. Um, so mm-hmm. we get less than half of the rainfall as Capelkirig, which is only 20 miles away. Um, because... As the, as the air comes up, it goes over the top of Snowdonia, rains on Snowdonia, and then we've got air that's, that's now drier air coming down towards us and warming up. So uh, it's more of an east-west switch because you've also got then the difference between the coastal climate and, and the inland climate because on, on the eastern coast, during, during the winter, the eastern side, during the winter, of course, because it's that bit further inland, because the mountains do cut it off from, from the uh, moderating coastal winds, mm-hmm. it does get extremely cold. So you, you'll find ice and snow on the ground for... For maybe weeks or even months uh, at, at certain times on end on the eastern side of Wales, whereas the west coast of Wales very, very rarely would get snow. 
So, so the, the climate difference is more east to west rather mm -hmm. than north to south. There's a gotcha. bit of difference between north and south, but it's mostly an east west split for the climate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in the 1980s, I had the pleasure of visiting South Wales, specifically uh, the area that's called Little England beyond Wales. And I think that's applied to an area of southern Pembrokeshire and southwestern Carmarthenshire. Um, and I was there to spend some time in South Wales, but particularly I was in Tenby vacationing for about 10 days. And they had a rail station and I hopped on that rail station and I went to the valleys and visited Triorki, which was the village my grandfather uh, okay. was born and grew up in. So I had a chance to walk the same streets that he oh. walked. Yeah. And that was that was really interesting. But I'm just curious about that phrase, Little England beyond Wales. What's the reason for that particular phrase? There are lots of little pockets of uh, that have been anglicized. And it's usually come from some point back in history. So, for instance, on the Isle of Anglesey, uh, Bomaris, um, my mother-in-law, who, who comes from Anglesey, mm -hmm. um, she calls Bomaris Little England um, because that was traditionally that the, the Normans came there. They set up a settlement there. The, the Welsh people, went, when Edward built his castle, kicked the Welsh out and, and made them go and live in a place called Newborough. He created a new borough for them. So mm -hmm. even though that was 800 years ago, that's a little Angles, part of Anglesey is, is, called, is called Little England. But the one you're talking about, yes, is the largest area down, down in Pembrokeshire. There's an actual line, it's called the Lanska Line. Uh, and it's actually, it, the, the A40 road uh, basically spits it. One side of the road is Welsh, the other side of the road is English. Um, <laughs> that there are two major forces. There's the original reason why it was, and then there's other reasons that have come on since. I mean, the original reason for that one is actually the Flemish people. Um, now, Flemish people, they came from uh, Belgium and what is now the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were there were terrible flooding there back in the oh god now uh, someone's gonna look this up and tell me I've got my it's either the eleventh or the twelfth century. Okay. Uh, I think it's the twelfth century. There was tremendous flooding there, so a lot of uh, of what we would now call uh, immigrants came in. Okay, a lot of refugees uh, fled those areas because their land was just, was just being flooded. Was being made, <clears> made, uh -huh. And they came into southern England, um, but the. The Normans were just at the time just establishing themselves in southern England. And the last thing they wanted was uh, another group of similar people uh, to fight over. So they actually banished the Flemish people to southwest Wales, oh. um, to the area around. They basically bo they, they boated them around to Milford Haven, which is in uh, the, this area of Pembrokeshire. Uh, mm -hmm. And they said, well, look, this is your area. You, you can live here and, and carry on your life uh, here. Uh, and that was the origin of those people being different. They were, they were literally boated in around from, I say, originally from, from um, Belgium and, and um, Netherlands, uh, and they were placed there. So that gave that part of mm -hmm. Pembroke a slightly different feel to the area further north. Again, we've got a geographical aspect because the area to the north of, of the A40 is called Priscelli mm -hmm. Mountains. So you're into mountains, which is your traditional uh, Welsh right. Celtic area, which, which wasn't invaded by anyone. Whereas to yeah. the south of it, it is lower and flatter land uh, that's there. So there's a, there's a geographical aspect to it. So that did formulate an area, and, and, and the language is different. And also the, the accent is different. In fact, my wife, when I, when I first met her, we, we were in Aberystwyth University. Uh, and I really offended her, her, her roommate uh, the first time <laughs> I met because she was talking and, and she, she said hello to me. And I said, so, is that a West Country accent I can hear? Because I, I, I generally thought she was either from Gloucestershire, where I come from, or maybe Devon mm. or Somerset. She's yeah, like, Damn, I'm Welsh. <laughs> 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 but to, to me, you know, and, that, and that's something you know, I, I've come from the West Country, and it, it just sounded like she was someone from the same area as we would. It's just the other side of, of the Bristol Channel. So, um, so linguistically, yes, they, they do sound English. Uh, English okay. is the, the predominantly spoken language. Um, so that made that difference mm -hmm. originally. Of course, because that area was more anglicised. As time has moved on and as, as history has moved on in the last couple of hundred years and people migrating to Wales, if you're an English person migrating to Wales, it's a much easier move to you to, to migrate to Little England, to, to mm. migrate to Southern Pembrokeshire, where everyone's speaking English. Uh, mm -hmm. There's, there's mm -hmm. no real big cultural difference. Whereas you go right. just the other side of that major road, you're going into villages where, uh, in particular, I said Priscelli Mountains is a very Welsh area. Um, so you'd be in, in, into going into the village shop and everyone there would be speaking Welsh. That's going to be quite hard to, to it could well be that it's choice. And it, it's also believed that, that estate agents, realtors, I think you call them, people who sell houses, will mm -hmm. have almost like 
they acted like the filter and, and, and they'd heard someone with, with, with an English accent want, want to move into Premature and they sort of what guided them that way. Where okay. if they hear them, they'll guide them to the other side of the line. So um, yeah. it's something that started almost a thousand years ago, but has accentuated over time, which is why there is quite a significant difference there. Say so there, there are other pockets that are very English anglicised along the mm -hmm. North Wales coast where we are in Llandidno, the River Conwy um, marks really the dividing line on the north coast between the anglicised part of it to the east and then the very Welsh part to the west once you go into Snowdonia. Again, it's the mountains is, is the big feature. Again, history is a big feature because Robert of Ritherland came in and, and took over parts of the North Wales coast um, mm -hmm. before Edward I. Um, so, uh, and, and then we've got the more recent history of the, the industrial cities of Manchester and Liverpool being very close and lots of people retiring into the North mm -hmm. East Wales coast because it's the closest part to Manchester and Liverpool. So um, it, it does seem to be a definite uh, feel that, that there's a bit of geography involved. There's a bit mm -hmm. of ancient history which which kicks off an area as being anglicised, but then over time that accentuates itself because it becomes a more um, desirable place for someone who's moving from England to come and actually live uh, and change. So Trevor, if I recall correctly, is housing more affordable in Wales than it is in England? Is there an attraction because of the cost of housing? Housing is cheaper. Um, affordability, I mean, to, to work out affordability, mm -hmm. they look at average wage rates versus the cost of housing. Uh, right. And we, I mean, Anglesey is, is the most, the second most unaffordable place to live in the UK um, mm. behind uh, Cornwall, which had a similar, similar feeling of, of very, a, a very, a very, basic um economy based on agriculture mm -hmm. and tourism so so mm -hmm. neither of those are particularly well wealthy uh, people uh, and then obviously nice houses in pretty areas that, that rich people mm -hmm. want to come and live in um so yeah the, the house price and you, you get more more bang for your buck you get more more, more house for your money here in wales than you would mm -hmm. in most parts of england there are some industrial areas of england which are similarly um low price but but yes generally right. wales on average is, is much cheaper and of course, the, the London market is its is, 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 is own little stratosphere. Um, you can sell yourself mm -hmm. a one bedroom flat in London. You can buy yourself a five bedroom house in North Wales. No problem at wow. all. The yeah. price is, is so great. So, uh, and, sure. and why wouldn't you? Why would you live, carry on living in a one bedroom flat in London? You could think of nothing worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, the, the language across or between North and South Wales also appears to have some different styles and yeah. words that people use across the country. There's a gentleman on YouTube who uh, teaches the Welsh language. His name doesn't come to me at this moment, I will, or else I would be happy to mention him. And I watch him sometimes, and he'll explain a phrase or a word, and he'll often say, now in North Wales, this is said this way, and in South Wales, you're more likely to hear it said this way. So yeah. can you shed some light on the different words and the reason for that difference between north and south yep definitely uh, and again it, I, I blame this for the fact that i'm not i'm still not fluent Welsh speaker myself i'm nearly there um mm -hmm. but i start i started that uh, life down in south wales and i started learning welsh uh, in south wales and i came up here and suddenly half the words i've learned are different words so in some mm -hmm. cases it's, it's an entirely different mm -hmm. word um so um Llaith, um, which is milk in South Wales, is llefrith in North Wales. Um, if you want a cup of tea in North Wales, you ask for a panad, a cup of day. In South Wales, it's a dish bled. Um, wow. Um, a grandmother is a nine in North Wales. She, she's a mamgi in, in, in South Wales. So there's lots of words oh, sure. that are totally different. Yeah, yeah. But then also then within that, you've got lots of small dialects where um, certain words and phrases ha are just much more common. So um, I say my, mother, my grandmother in law comes from Anglesey. If she's listening to someone who's, who comes from Carnarvon speaking, she has to really concentrate and listen because the way they speak mm -hmm. and some of the words they use are, are totally different. Usually there's, there's, there is an, a correct Welsh word. And what's happened is in certain parts, it's been changed into something else usually shortened uh like like panad which which is cup of tea is is short for kupan a day so they just call it panad um and and that's just the way it it's it, it's it's come about you know people have shortened things um so there is an official uh, welsh word for most things um but it, in most places because of the history of wales because certain parts of wales are have been very much cut off from each other and particularly mm -hmm. in south wales not many people would ever have moved it from South Wales to North Wales. So 
although they have the same original language uh, and they'd have had maybe a few rulers who were very common and, and spoke Welsh, mm. everything else has, has been changed and, and, and two have been kept apart. So and that's why you would get that difference. Um, I say it, it's really noticeable from the bottom of Wales to the, to the top of Wales that there's a, there's a, a clear difference. But even within certain places, you, you can you can walk ten miles and there's a different dialect or, or a few different types of words that people use, and certainly obviously accents uh, change as well. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, and it, like I say it comes down to the kingdoms that that, that, that proliferated over Wales. There, there were lots of separate, separate different kingdoms. Um, Halvar is someone who was who's quite prominent in, in Welsh history because he he's, he was the first person to try to to link together. Um, Wales as as a, as a nation, uh, mm-hmm. and he brought in a similar legal system. So even though he he wasn't he wasn't the ruler of, of all of Wales, he tried to make sure that all of the different kingdoms and princedoms that, that were dotted around had mm-hmm. the same order of law, so that so, so that there was a bit of commonality there. Um, and similar things would have happened to, to, with with language. People would have moved around Wales and brought certain words, so they become common throughout Wales. But because there was you know, people didn't move around as much as it. you're talking about a few people moving around, people like Gerald of Wales, who went all the way around Wales. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. They might bring a few uh, different words and a bit, bit of commonality, but really that the two areas were totally separated. Yeah. Yeah. I have one more question for you. This is the million dollar question and perhaps one that'll get the most comments on uh, the video. And that is, is there a political difference or a view of politics that's different between North and South Wales. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it, but it's not so much North and South Wales. There, there, mm-hmm. are, there are quite unique different places within Wales. Um, and, and we are basically run by a government that's in the very southeastern corner of Wales. You've got the right. city of Newport and particularly the city of, of Cardiff. Uh, and that's where most of the politicians, certainly the senior politicians, hail from. That's where they stay. And, and it's got a whole set of different economy to the rest of us. It's, it's mm-hmm. much closer linked to England. You've got a motorway right. going straight across. It's two hours to London. Um, so it's it's continued to grow economically, whilst the rest of Wales has been left behind. Um, and then when you look at the political map of Wales, you'll see different parties doing um, it, do, doing well in, in different areas. Um, so the coal mining area, the former coal mining area, is just mm-hmm. to the north of Cardiff. Even though they're very close to Cardiff, are politically very, very different. Um mm socially very different and economically very different. You know, it, it's, it's very much you know, little small little communities who, who know each other, whereas Cardiff could be a city anywhere in the world. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's mm-hmm. more metropolitan. Um, right. Then you go into, over to south to, to southwest Wales uh, and then into, into mid Wales, and you've got predominantly agricultural um, communities. So they tend to vote for the parties who support agricultural things. So they tend mm-hmm. to be pro-conservative um, or for Plaid Cymru. Um, and then you come to North Wales, uh, and, and then you've got uh, in Northwest Wales, you've got that's the homeland of, of Welsh nationalism. So that's where Plaid Cymru's main base of support really is in, in Northwest Wales. And then in Northeast Wales, uh, along the coast, you've got lots of retired people from, from cities in England. So they bring with them their politics from, from there, um, mm-hmm. which, which is different from the local people. So um, there's definitely a, a political uh, divide across Wales. But again, it's, I wish it was as simple as a north-south divide. It's it's it's, it's all yeah. over the place. There, there are sure, gotcha. all over all over the place. But we really do feel in the north that we are the the the, the forgotten little brother mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. of the south because a lot of things are, are new laws are brought in or changes are made and we think, yeah, I can see why that would work in Cardiff. It doesn't work here. Um, right. The classic one we've got going on at the moment is. Um, the Welsh government is keen, is desperate for to, to, to be more environmentally sensitive, which is which is which is great. Um, mm-hmm. And in in the cities, it really makes sense to build lots of cycle re- uh, lanes, get mm-hmm. people out of cars and onto bikes. Which in a flat city, when you've got some nice routes, it, it, it works really well. Yeah. So every county in Wales has been given um, a target for a, a certain many kilo- amount of kilometres of, of cycle paths. But when you're in, in, in a very wet part of the world mm-hmm. with very steep hills. And big distances yeah. between the villages, cycle paths are, are not what we need. <laughs> we need sure, right. So, so a decision that's been made in, in, in Cardiff, that's sensible in Cardiff, just doesn't work for the north. And we've got big problems. Um, it's just happened this week now. So it's, it's kicking off again um, with, with our agriculture. Mm-hmm. Uh, as part of these 
uh, bid to become sustainable, sustainable. Our government wants us to plant lots and lots of trees. Great for that. Uh, but their their latest policy is to have every farm, every farm now, has to put aside 10% of its land and plant trees on it. And the wow. farmers are up in arms. They're saying, well, you're taking 10% away of my income. You know, my my mm-hmm. costs are the same. So yeah, I'm still exactly. going to have to have the combine halves. I'm going to have to have all the things. And, and now I've got 10% less fields yeah. because you're going to plant trees. And, and again, it's something that's done by someone who doesn't really understand how the, the area mm-hmm. works economically or geographically. I mean, there's, there's lots right. of parts of, of Wales which are absolutely perfect for growing huge forests, you know, because there's very marginal farmland as we were driving through Snowdon. I don't even remember, you've got mm-hmm. lots of land with, with a few sheep on there. And yes. Fine, but those areas could all be forested, but mm-hmm. our prime farmland, um, you know, which is good dairy herds and, and, and can grow crops, mm-hmm. is crucial. And, and you know, it's, it's money making. Um, and to say to them, well, no, you've got to have 10% of your land for trees has gone down like a lead balloon. Mm, I'll bet. <laughs> so, sure. yeah, so there, there's, there's tractor protests all over the country. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's a, so there's definitely a political divide there, yeah. Yeah, the, the, those tractor protests, I think, are happening in other parts of Europe, are they not no, against that's some why it's come regulation? To, it, that's yeah. why it's come to here, because they, they've seen the French farmers, and the French farmers mm-hmm. have always been good. You know, the slightest thing for French farmers, they're going to have to <laughs> uh, uh, I think they've yeah. seen that. And this new uh-huh. policy in Wales is just coming to coming to and, and they're thinking, right, well, you know, we're not going to be uh, pushed around anymore. We're going to protest. So, yeah, we've had some, quite a few protests here in North Wales huh? and in South Wales. Great. Yeah. Well, Trevor, any any final thoughts you had and anything you no, wanted to No, I was to just going to tell you yeah. more about the, the, the language, really, of Wales. Wonderful. And yeah. If you have a look at a map, you know, I'm sure you can find one up for your viewers to see. Um, the proportion of people speaking Welsh is not even throughout Wales. There are certain pockets where it's very, very highly mm-hmm. Welsh and certain mm-hmm. pockets where it's hardly ever spoken. Um, and it, it's, it's a sort of West East divide, but the closer you get to England, generally the fewer Welsh speakers, but there are lots of pockets and lots of very interesting places where Welsh is extremely strong or very, very weak. And, and, mm. and usually you have, you have to go into those areas to find out where they are. You talked about Triorchy earlier. I mean, that's in the valleys mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. and it's not very Welsh there. Um, there's not an awful lot of Welsh spoken mm-hmm. in the valleys, uh, right. and that's because of um, the coal mining industry, because lots of coal mines uh, were set up in, in the valleys. Uh, and it came just at the time when the Black Country, now the Black Country is um, just, just to the west of Birmingham. Um, mm-hmm. it, it was, a, it was okay. one of the original coal mining areas. Mm-hmm. Um, it's called the Black Country because of all the coal that was there. Well, that, that industry was just coming to a close as the Welsh mines were opening up. So, of course, mm. tens of thousands of miners were moving from the Midlands into the South Wales Valleys, bringing mm. with them their language. Yeah, so interesting. Yeah. There you've got the Welsh language w- was completely squashed, whereas the, the quarries in North Wales, the slate quarries in North Wales, the language is purely in Welsh. There, there wasn't, at the time when the Welsh uh, slate quarries were growing, the port of Liverpool was also growing and Manchester was, was, was a thriving place. So there was no need for the English mm-hmm. to come across mm-hmm. to fill the jobs uh, that were being created, so it came right. mostly Welsh. So that so, so that explains why you've got certain areas which are very anglicised. I mean, your Pembrokeshire area is is, a, is clearly an example, mm-hmm. whereas other ones are very very heavily Welsh. So if, I say if if you can find a map to show the, the actual proportion of people speaking Welsh, you'll see very very clear uh, differences. And in all of those, you can really explain. You can look at it and look at the history. And explain it. it's fantastic how our, how our history and our geography always come together and explain yeah. everything you know, you know, that's me as a, as a former history and geography teacher i suppose mm-hmm. just, just saying um not all the other subjects don't matter i'm sure i'm sure the scientists would have, have a word with me about that but uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you know the history of an area and you put it together with the geography you can usually explain why it is like it is sure yeah well trevor this has absolutely been great it's been fascinating and interesting and I want to thank you so much for joining us today and sharing with us your personal knowledge and experience of Wales. Uh, it's really been fantastic. And again, I want to remind anyone that if you are traveling to North Wales in the future, uh, Trevor uh, runs a great little company, uh, Tudno Tours, and um, there he goes. <laughs> He's showing My his wife's logo. <laughs> she, she, she's done this on her embroidery machine for me. <laughs> 
<laughs> so go ahead and give Trevor a, a call or you can find him a trip advisor and I'll leave his other contact information uh, below. But thank you, Trevor, again, for your insightful knowledge uh, of Wales. Appreciate it very, very much. So this is Greg Thomas and I want to say a uh, hoil an hour. Bye for now. And we'll catch all of you next time. Bye bye. Well, to that.